Welcome to our Uber Christmaka episode of Kimfit. I'm Michael. I'm Tiffany, and today it is a beautiful December afternoon, and we are filming today at Marche Central. And as you can see, all the snow from last episode has melted. Boo. Yes. But anyhow, today is very, very exciting. Yes, we have a friend, Jordan, helping me with my fit tip on skis. And I got my Christmas poo. Yeah, and since we're here, I feel like doing some Christmas shopping. Oh, oh so let's get to fit news. So what is going on in Fit News this week? Well, our friend Eric actually pointed, uh, showed me this. It's, uh, if, we, if you visit the Concept2 website, uh, Concept2 is, uh, is the makers of the rowing machines that you see in gyms. Mm -hmm. If you visit their website, not only do you see like, uh, the different type of rowers that they have, you can actually look up world record times for those rowing machines. Oh. So someone who did 2000, uh, like there's a record, world record time for each distance, for 2,000 meters, 500 meters, uh, 1,500 meters. Uh, oh. This is, I have to make note that this is only for the rowing machines. These times are only for the rowing machines and it's not the, the world record times you see for like the ones you, for rowers that row in canals and stuff. Oh, like okay. That. So on the machine itself. Yeah, it's world record times on the machine. Cool. Yeah, that's really interesting. And another really interesting was that you can actually uh, have a kind of like a logbook online mm -hmm. where you log your times for certain distances. Okay. So let's say I rowed 500 meters. I would log that down in my online logbook, and then for day two, I would compare my day two time to my day one time to see if I'm improving or not. And uh, what's, what else is really interesting about that is that you can compare your time with people, other people's times around the world. Ooh, so you international. Get to, yeah, you get to share your times to see, like, you know, kind of motivate each other to improve. Oh. Yeah, that's really neat, and there's also other features on the site as well. You can look up, uh, you can have, like, uh, calculators and advice you can look up on. Uh, you can calculate your VO2 max. Ah, and so, interesting. Yeah, and some of the advice I'm, uh, I'm talking about is that uh, they have articles and suggestions and tips on how to train with the rower. So let's say I want to train for weight loss. They'll give me suggestions and tips for that. Uh, for cross training or there's even articles for uh, uh, people who are diabetic and use the rowers. Okay. And uh, a lot of useful information. And. Uh, Definitely check it out. We'll have, our, we'll have the link in our show notes. Mm, very, very cool. Yeah, and uh, there's also online forums, so you can actually talk to people about certain topics as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's pretty neat. So what else is going on, though? I actually came across this uh, website by accident. It's called theworkstationworkout.com. It's actually a company based in Toronto. Ooh, Tio. And uh, it's very similar to the My Food Phone and the training websites, I, the services I mentioned. Okay. Where... It helps, motiv helps you motivate to work out at work. So what you do is you actually go to the website and you, reg and you register okay. your yourself and your company. Okay, I believe registration is free. Okay. But uh, the services that you, that you actually get is that you get to choose six personal trainers. Yeah. You get access to one naturopath and one nutritionist. Okay. And every day, okay, at 11 a.m. At, and at 3 p.m., you get, an, you get a kind of like an email notification. Okay. And when you get that notification, you go to the website, you log into your account, and once you log in, you get uh, videos from your trainers, from your six trainers that give you exercises to do while you're at work. Wow. Yep. And you also get uh, a little feedback from your nutritionist okay. and your naturopath. So you get to work out twice a day at work, one time, once at 11 a.m. and once at 3 p.m. Okay, and these are all exercises designed for you to do at work. Yeah, at work. Yeah, there's actually uh, they actually give you videos, and you actually you can actually check out the demo video they have on their website, and you see the trainer actually doing exercises, oh. and you just follow along. That's cool. And how much is it going to cost? Yeah, because registration I said was free, right? But the actual service is 650 per month. Okay. Okay. That's not too bad. It's not too bad considering that you know. Uh, hiring a personal trainer can be expensive, and having a nutrition can be expensive too, like almost like $100, $200 a month. Okay. So having the service for $650 a month is really, really good. Oh. And, uh, like I said, it's great for people who don't have time to work out, and they're always at work, and they can work out at work. Not too bad, not too bad at all. Not too bad. Um, oh, yes, and it is official since December the 5th. Um, New York City has officially banned trans fats from restaurants. So that is very, very cool. Um, I think it's the first uh, city in North America to do this. So hopefully the other major cities will follow suit. Yeah, okay? we'll catch you up. Soon. So <laughs> anyways, um, I think that will be it for Fit News this week. So for this week's Fit Tip, I have my friend Jordan. All right. Who's going to help us with our ski tip. Now, Jordan, you've been a ski instructor for eight years, I think? Yeah, just about. Oh, that's cool. So uh, before we get into the boots and the skis, 
Uh, I just like to remind everybody that when you go skiing, just like running, you want to wear proper clothing. So you want to have a base layer, a middle layer, and an outer layer. Now for your jacket, you should be wind resistant and water resistant. Uh, pants, which was something I didn't go over with, same thing, you want to have a base layer, a mid layer, and an outer layer. So for your snow pants, you want something that's water resistant and wind resistant as well. Now, uh, for, for, so for beginners who've never really skied or skied once or twice, and they actually want to buy equipment, what would you recommend to them? Um, actually, first thing I would suggest for people that are starting off is to rent a set for either one or two seasons. Um, and that's mainly just to get a feel for what kind of skiing they're going to be doing and how they, they like to ski. Skiing is very it's personal. Um, it's basically like a car. Everybody, every car has a different feel to it while every ski and every boot has a different feel to it. Um, starting with the boot, for example, the standard features right now, well, the average, is having about a four buckle system, which is good at distributing the pressure over the whole foot. Okay. Um, that way it can fit itself to different people and, and really hold it down well to, uh, to, to, to the, the form of everybody's foot. Okay. Um, one thing to keep in mind, I'm just going to say right off the bat, is ski socks. Uh, when people go skiing, they have the habit of, of loading up on their socks because their feet get cold. One thing to keep in mind is that when you load up on socks, either where you wear multiple layers or you wear a really thick sock, what happens is when it's in the boot, it, when, the, when you lock the boot down, it compresses your foot and the sock actually cuts off the circulation of your foot. Ah. And that's one of the reasons your feet actually get cold. Okay. What a lot of experts have suggested is to wear a thinner sock. They, scale, they sell ski, ski socks that are made of several different materials, wool included and another mix match of, uh, of different materials that are thin, but at the same time are very warm. Okay. So the fact that they're thin doesn't cut off the circulation and to keep your foot nice and toasty. Okay. Um, so in terms of the market for boots, uh, Price-wise, you're looking to spend, if you're going to buy, about, on average, somewhere between $200 to about $500 for the average boot. Uh, of course, there are more expensive boots, as the athletic sport price has no limit sometimes. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is sometimes there are boots that they sell with moldable liners. You buy the boot, you'll heat up the liner, and... Uh, That's obviously more expensive. It's obviously it is a more expensive boot. But uh, in terms of comfort, they do help a lot. So it's, it's an instant molding of your foot. You heat up the, the liner and uh, you stick your foot in it, hold it for about 10 minutes. And just go. Okay. Yeah, just <laughs> so uh, let's quickly go over the sizing because I know the sizing is a little bit different. I wear size 9 shoes and yeah. these are actually my boots. And I'm not too sure. They're 27? 27. And the, the length of the boot is not the same, obviously, as, as uh, a shoe size. This, I believe, is in, uh, is in centimeters. Okay. So you've got about a 27 centimeter long boot okay uh, we'll actually have a conversion chart for you in our show notes and uh, basically you can check your shoe size for uh, for uh, compared with the ski boot size uh, now if you were at the store okay and you were even though you know the, the ski boot size what's the best way to figure out whether or not the ski boot actually fits you oh in terms of, of fitting of the boot um, there's two quick tests that you can do one is the instant test whether it hurts or not um, if it hurts it's definitely a no-go um, the other thing to keep in mind is um, width if is the width of the boot right because the ski boot's a hard shell it's not like a it's not like a regular shoe it doesn't have room to flex as much okay so width is a big factor with a lot of ski boots okay. um to check the length it's the first test would be whether you stand up straight if the tip of your, your your big toe touches the tip of the boot and i don't mean compressed i mean just touches comfortably um the other test is when you bend down and put all the pressure on the front of the boot if your toe pulls away from the tip and you feel your heel nice and snug in the in the, in the end. Okay. So That's those good. are the, the two quick things that you'll do. Mostly the salesman will, will suggest that you do that too. Okay. So I know, so what we would look for in skis then? In skis, um, it's like a boot. It's got a lot of room for you. Um, there are many different materials that you can use as a core, which again changes the feel of the Right. Um, there's a traditional wood, there are composites, carbon and fiberglass and that and other materials that are a little more uh, a little more space age. But uh, again, that all comes down to how the ski feels. So that's why I suggest that for the first few years, it's always a good idea to rent a set for the, either the first season or the first two seasons. Um, and that way you get a feel of where you're going to be skiing, what kind of skiing you're going to do. And you get to sort of test the field of, of the skis that you rent to know whether they're good for you or not. Um, how do you know which type of ski to buy? What type of ski? Um, that's pretty much depending on what you're going to be doing. Um, 
If you're going to be like a lot of people nowadays, going to the ski parks, uh, the snow parks, and, and hitting the uh, the half pipes, things like that, uh, they sell twin tips, which are a ski with a tip like this on both ends. This one's not. It has a slight curve, but it's not considered a twin uh, twin tip. The other thing for the twin tips is that they've got harder edges. They're made to be a little bit more abused than the average ski because they're going to be put to more punishment in the okay. uh, in the snow park. Okay. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But on the average ski. Um, the shape of the ski usually is what makes the difference for where you're going to be skiing. Okay. If you're going to be skiing on regular car, on uh, regular uh, room slopes like we have in Eastern Canada, you want to get an ultra, like a regular average ski. Right. That can deal with powder groomed. Uh, versus in Western Canada, you're going to be going for more for the powder skis because okay. of big mounds over there. Um, the difference is mainly there's the width and the length. The width. For let's say a powder ski, for example, would be a lot wider than a, than an average ski. Okay. And the length will will change depending on, again, feel. Okay. Now speaking also. of like length, uh, how would someone know how long they should buy their skis for? On average, most a good way to start is uh, the height of the person. Okay. So you measure the ski up to the top of your forehead, and that should be a pretty good measure. Uh, okay. Again, there's room for feel. So some people like shorter skis are a little more maneuverable. Some people like longer skis that are a little quicker. Okay. Um, like giant slalom skis, those brace skis are, uh, are very long. Okay. But they're very stiff, so uh, okay. kind of hard to control. And uh, in general, just like for the boots, uh, base base price for someone who's beginner skier. Which, if they were to buy skis, what, what would be a recommended price for them? Recommended price, again, there's room depending on sales and things like that. But nowadays, usually, if you uh, look at the end of the season or beginning of the season, you can usually get some pretty good deals. Um, you're looking to spend somewhere between, on average, about three hundred to six hundred dollars. Pretty expensive. So. Yeah, it's, it's an expensive sport. Um, all the more reason to, to rent for the first few seasons right. so that you don't spend that money and, and make a mistake. Okay. Um, but I noticed you have a, a yeah. pair of short skis. That's right. These are actually my little mini skis here, and uh, a lot cheaper. Uh, I got them for about a hundred to hundred and thirty dollars. Now, what can you tell us about mini skis? Uh, mini skis, like I said before, um, the shorter the ski, the more maneuverable, and this is pretty much as maneuverable as you can get. Um, it's virtually like skating downhill. Okay. Very, very fun. Very easy to get the feel of. Not like skis because there's less less length on it, so it's, it's not as alien. Yeah, so it's easy. It's easier to basically grasp the, yeah. the technique. It's a lot easier just to jump on and, and try. Okay, that's cool. Very fun. Okay, and relatively inexpensive. Yeah, I uh, believe mine were about one hundred and thirty dollars, one hundred to one hundred thirty. Yeah. Right. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, just a brief thing. I just want to cover uh, maintenance. Uh, how would you maintain your skis? Because it's not that you just finish skiing and just throw them in the closet. Uh, Pretty much, um, the average maintain maintenance that you're gonna have to do is sharpening the edges and waxing the bottom surface. Okay. Uh, most places like sports acts for things like that will do that for you. Okay, and uh, how often would you want to re-wax and re-sharpen your skis? Depending on how much you ski. Okay. Um, if you go about about eight to ten times a season, you don't want to do it every season. Okay. If you're going to be doing more than that. Should be enough, but uh, it, it all depends. I mean, if more for the average person, if you're going to go going about three, four times a season, you could probably do it every two years. Okay. But that's pushing it a bit. All right. On average, it's good to do it once a season. Okay. And as you can see on this one, there's a bit of uh, yeah. a bit of damage on the on the bottom surface of the uh, of the blade, mm -hmm. which again that'll rectify itself once it gets waxed and, and, and maintained. Okay. So it's all not, right. Not to worry. Sounds great. Perfect. Well, thanks for being on the show today, and uh, well, hopefully we can get you back next time for another ski tip, and uh, that's it for this week. So old man winter has heard me talking about him and uh, decided to make it colder. So I had to move indoors for this week's Infoodmation. And speaking about Infoodmation, this week we're going to be talking about holiday tips for eating. Very, very important because, of course, it's holiday season, and what that means is lots and lots of food, lots and lots of uh, end-of-year parties to go to, um, and typically it's the time that we generally gain a little bit more weight, okay? So what should we do to uh, make sure we don't do that? Um, first thing is don't skip any meals, okay? If you know you're going to a Christmas party or a um, work office party or something, uh, eat like you normally would and just go and not overindulge in, in the eating part, right? That just makes sense because if you're going to go and on an empty stomach and you're hungry, you're going to eat a whole lot more and then afterwards you're not going to feel so well. So that's the big thing. First, make sure you eat properly. Don't skip meals. Go there like how you would normally go for any meal. Okay. Uh, second thing, 
liquid calories add up, right? So, of course, it's fine to have your glass of wine or a beer with dinner, but especially around this time, the eggnog and all that, really, really heavy in calories. So don't have too, too much of it. Um, so be careful, uh, you know, have one or two, but don't go nuts. Um, and don't over drink, basic rule, right? Um, so next thing is that we usually have a large variety of snack foods at these get-togethers, and it's fine to have a little bit of everything, but the key word is a little bit of everything, okay? So quality, not quantity. You don't have to have large portions of everything. Small portions of everything will do, and you still get to taste everything. So that's a, that's a good little tip there. Um, and when you go, try to have a little bit more of the healthy food first. Like, don't forget, you still need to eat your vegetables and your fruits and all that stuff. So have that in the beginning so you don't forget them. And second of all, then you won't have to say, oh, well, I'm full from all the other stuff. I don't need to eat this now. Okay? No, you still need all your fruits and vegetables. Okay? So have all that stuff first. Um, and, of course, keep in mind that every little bit counts. So whatever you eat is going to add up in the end. All right? So... If you are, say, baking as well, and you're eating as you bake or uh, preparing meals and you're, you're eating as you go along, that still adds up. Okay, so remember, just because it's not sitting down and eating at a meal doesn't mean it's not eating. Okay, and very, very, very important, don't forget your activity. Okay, holiday season doesn't mean that you have to sit around and not move. Um, Right now, since the weather is still pretty decent, you could still go for your walks and your runs. Um, however, once it starts to snow or get a little bit colder, you can do your winter activities, tobogganing, skating, all that kind of fun stuff, and maybe some skiing. But anyhow, until then, we will hopefully keep those suggestions in mind and uh, have a good holiday eating time. And I'll be this week for Infoodmation. So this rest of our Christmas uh, episode of KidFit. Please check back our show notes for all the important information you need to find out since there was so much of it this week. <laughs> and if you have any ideas, suggestions, or questions you want to give us, just email them to us at info at kinfit.tv. Big thank you goes to Jordan, our special guest today, and Amanda, our camera lady. Yep. And us at Kinfit would like to wish everyone out there a joyful Christmas holiday. So, eat. Be safe. And eat some more, but not too much. And uh, now that we're done, let's go do some Christmas shopping. Because we're at the favorite place in the whole world. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. So remember, don't quit. Stay fit. So this wraps up our Christmas special of uh, KidFit. Or actually, Uber Christmaska episode. That's right, Christmaska. <laughs> Christmaska. Right. World. Mech. So. See you next time. So don't remember. Stay quit fit. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> uh, I knew. I knew. It. I forgot my line. Sorry, I forgot my line. I